Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully awakened one. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So tonight we're going to talk about 106. And this is the Anenja Sapaya Sutta, the way to the imperturbable. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living in the Kuru country where there was a town of the Kurus named Kamasadama. And there the blessed one addressed the monks thus, monks, venerable sir, they replied. And the blessed one said this, <clears throat> monks, sensual pleasures are impermanent, hollow, false, deceptive, they are illusory, the prattle of fools, sensual pleasures here and now, and sensual pleasures in lives to come, sensual pleasures here and now, and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Both alike are Mara's realm, Mara's domain, Mara's bait, Mara's hunting ground, and on account of them, these evil unwholesome mental states, such as covetousness, ill will, and presumption arise. They constitute an obstruction to a noble disciple in training here. The imperturbable. Therein monks and noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come all constitute an obstruction to a noble disciple in training here. Suppose I were to abide with a mind abundant and exalted, having transcended the world and made a firm determination with my mind. When I do so, there will be no evil unwholesome mental states such as covetousness, ill will, presumption in me. And with the abandoning of them, my mind will be unlimited, immeasurable, well-developed. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. And this, monks, is declared to be the first way directed to the imperturbable. First thing you have to know about this, when we're talking about covetousness, ill will, and presumption in me, we're talking about lust, hatred, and the aversion, the presumption about things, presuming things are this way, presuming it leading to desire or aversion, attachment or aversion. And the other thing is what is the imperturbable really about is the highest possible level of equanimity that cannot be broken, that you would mind would be in the highest level of equanimity it's imperturbable. Another word is undisturbable. You were looking for words that worked with it. Nothing can disturb you. This bhikkhus is declared to be the first way directed to the imperturbable. So you're practicing on the imperturbable and he's saying that when you pass to another birth, you would, you would come into the imperturbable. 
Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, there are sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Whatever material form there is, all material form is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in his base. Then once there in full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. When it says resolves upon it with wisdom, it's resolving um, the, what's the disturbances to get the full confidence through watching what's happening in terms of dependent origination. So you see how everything works. The fact that we've taught you dependent origination the way we've taught it to you is kind of a remarkable thing because now you can watch any event. You can, I don't know if you've done it yet, but you just look around you and you can see people coming together in different situations and watch the pieces, the seven links happening. And that's what have allowing you to see what exactly happens between people that makes them behave this way or that way in their behavior patterns. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. So once again, he's saying that this is possible. And the, the bhikkhus or the monks, it is declared to be the second way directed to the imperturbable. The next one is, again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come, sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come, material forms here and now and material forms in lives to come, perception of forms here and now, perceptions of forms in lives to come. Both alike are impermanent. What is impermanent is not worth delighting in, not welcoming, not worth welcoming, and not worth holding to it. Remember the phrase in Chichaka Sutta basically talks about this. If you delight in it, welcome it, and remain holding to it, then lust is in you. Remember that phrase? So here it is again in this sutta, like a mirror coming back. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in the base and once there in full confidence. He either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. He dissects it, he thinks about it and looks about how it works and is interested in this, what it means. He examines what's going on here. What if I'm there and is it going on there in the same way? And he sees how it all begins to work the same way. And on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. And this monks is declared to be the third way directed to the imperturbable. So what you're getting here is that if you have knowledge of how everything works and you're getting close to death and dying, well, we go back to Anathapindika Sutta to see what Sariputta instructed him to do and how in 143, he taught the patient who was ill, who was Anathapindika, how to occupy himself up to the point where he took a breath and let his breath out and he was gone. To that very point, he told, taught him how to do it. You remember hearing, I will not cling to the body and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. So giving up everything having to do with the five aggregates, the six kinds of feelings, the, everything and the world, just everything and the elements my consciousness is not going to be dependent on that. So when you know you're at a point of terminally, you're leaving 
very shortly and you're ill. Or the other place, I actually taught somebody this and then they were killed in a car crash in Florida. And his wife said that he was doing this, he was still mumbling it. And he died doing that. He died letting go. When initially I taught it to a woman who had leukemia and they were taking her to the hospital to give her more and more replacement for her blood each time, you know? And she was like something crazy, like every fourth or fifth day they were going to the hospital. And she was 91 and she wanted to learn it. And I taught it to her and then I recorded it for her. And then she was doing it with the recording. And then she was doing it by herself. And they say when she died, she just had a smile on her face. And she just had a smile. She went. And I believe it because my uncle left the way he left was so simple. It was like, I'm going to lie down now. I'm finished. He said to his son and and then he gave a message to him for me to call me and get, tell me a message. He called me the next day. And the thing was, that was the same way his wife had died. She was taking a nap and she said, Joe. And he said, yes, honey. And she said, I'm going to go now. And he knew exactly what she meant. He was sitting beside her reading a newspaper in a chair and she was on the bed taking a nap. She'd had a stroke, was partially blind, paralyzed on one side, 93 years old. And she just kind of woke up and just said that. And he said, okay. And then she closed her eyes. And what was so cute about it was, and it was cute. There's no other way to say it. She pops out of leaving for a split second and says, Joe. And he says, yeah, honey. And she says, I forgot. I'll see you next time. And then she closed her eyes and she passed away. It was great when he told me, I just, he told me that before he died. And, and then he went very calmly himself. So where are we at the point where we leave is very interesting. We have really done a job on death, you know, in our societies around the world. The idea of being terrified of death can happen to a person it can honestly and legitimately from a past karmic experience in another life but the overall crunch on death i maybe should take death to to the courtroom too <laughs> maybe i should do a thing for death too because i think death is innocent too and the reason i'm saying that is because when, when i started to to look at anathapindika sutta before giving it to anybody I was considering what I knew about hospitals and I worked as a staffing coordinator in a big hospital. So I was aware of everything going on in this middle-sized hospital, it was pretty big. And um, when somebody died, the whole hospital would get upset if it was a child or a young person. But I watched what happened when people were dying and how it affected people. And it's like a terror to a lot of people, just terrified of it. And yet to die, to, to be born and then to die are two of the natural parts of life, just natural. So I got curious and Bonte just told me to keep digging and I kept digging and came up with where is the most pain in a hospital? And I knew pretty much the answer, but I wanted to hear other nurses tell me where the worst pain and the, the sound of it was in a hospital. And I thought, well, they're gonna tell me it's the emergency room or something like that, or they're going to um, something very chronic or something like that, maybe, I, I don't know. I just waited to see. And sure enough, what happened was the worst place was not where the people came in and were prepared to die, were preparing to die from terminal diseases. And I thought maybe it would be there. The worst places for the sound of fear and everything was obstetrics. <laughs> and I thought, perfect, yeah. The women in there having their labor pains and the situation I went through with the, um, my first, uh, my, no, I'm sorry, it was my, my second child, uh, was the woman next to me that they put me in the room had no training in Lamas at all. She wasn't prepared to give birth. She was absolutely terror. 
And I wanted to help her so badly, but I was having contractions too. And finally, I very quietly said to the nurse, look, it's this way. After she was shrieking for about the third time, I said, please get her out of here. I might just figure out how to get out of bed and just you know, help me do something. I can't do anything for her. And they finally put us in two separate rooms. When another person left, they put us into a separate room. But honestly, that's where the most fearful stuff is to be heard, is what the nurses all agreed about. And they made a point to me, with one of the older nurses said to me, how many people have you seen die? And I'd only seen about three or four people die. And, um, but I never really was watching closely. And she made a point, when you listen to how birth is happening, I want you to consider how death is happening. And this is something I was teaching with the class on Anathapindica. If you wanna understand how to die, just pause for a second and close your eyes and take three breaths. And the third breath, take a deep breath and just let it out all the way and let it go. And that's the end. That's the end. It will not always happen that peacefully, I grant you. But that is the last point of it is what she was saying to me. This is very interesting. So where we're going or where our consciousness is going is what he's talking about in this. And he's trying to reiterate the importance of acceptance of Anicca here with what is impermanent is not worth delighting in, not worth welcoming, not worth holding to. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in the base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. And on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable again. And thus monks is declared to be the third way directed to the imperturbable. Now the base of nothingness. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now, and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Material forms here and now and material forms in lives to come. Perceptions of forms here and now and perceptions of forms in lives to come and perceptions of the imperturbable. All of these are perceptions. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime namely in the base of nothingness. When the pra he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. And once there is full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness nor uh, now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness, it may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. And this, monks, is declared to be the first way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, monks, a disciple gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut considers thus, this is void of a self or of what belongs to a self. And when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in the base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. And on the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. And this is declared to be the second way directed at the base of nothingness. So he's practicing 
letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, abandoning, 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 to see what's left, just to see what's left. Not demanding anything is the key here. And again, monks, the noble disciple considers thus, I am not anything belonging to anyone anywhere, nor is there anything belonging to me in anyone anywhere. This is when he's practicing in this way and frequently abides thus, the mind acquires confidence in this base. When it, it means when he practices and frequently abides thus, the mind accepts the statement as of, of an examination, sinks into that idea. It's going into pure process, confidence in this space. And once there is confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom, continuing to examine it, using the dependent origination to see any alternative. And there's no way out of the fact it's just pure process. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. And this, monks, is declared to be the third way directed to the base of nothingness. This idea of resolving upon it with wisdom is using the human cognition line to examine what's happening when there's nothing turning anymore on the wheel. Just seeing it, not going to any description of anything, anywhere, any analyzing, nothing. You, what you're doing at this point, this is why I said this is pretty for advanced meditators to sit and contemplate nothing. You know, someone asked me once why I was teaching some people in a hospital. Um, there was a teaching them power sets. It started with some nurses and there were some doctors who wanted to do it too. They're teaching them power sets. So what are we teaching them to do and why is it a power set? We have to ask the neurologist this to really understand, but he'll tell you. You know, if you can convince a person to buy into the idea investigating the idea of nothingness and go deeper and deeper into it of nothing going on in the brain. If you can teach the brain what that's like and when you're sitting in your meditation working in nothingness or neither perception or non-perception, that's the place where you are beginning to taste what it's like if everything has stopped happening that normally would be happening in life in this brain, you see. Well, what do we know about the brain? We know that if the brain has no pressure on it, no stress, no tension, no stress at all, that the brain is a miraculous healing system for the entire body, that if you can empty out and let the teach your mind to let go of this while you're sitting in meditation, then it stands to reason. And these people that I was teaching usually had been sitting for an hour or two hours. Then I would say, do you want to learn power sits? And to learn a power sit, this one, this one doctor was great. He said, I said, where do you do this? You're so busy. He said, no, it's easy. I know where there's a utility room. I said, a utility room. And you go in the utility room and sit on a, on a stool that's in the utility room and shut the door. And he gives himself five, 10 minutes and then he comes back. And he says, it feels so remarkable because you've cleared, you've taught the mind what it feels like by discovering the level of nothingness and working through it. And then working with neither perception or non-perception, you've sat that deep. So now just consider, stop trying to figure out what any of it is. And if you can teach the mind, it's okay, it's okay if I do this. And then if you can say to the mind, if you've just been practicing going to bed at night and what time you're going to get up, that's enough determination to do this. Because now you're going to say, okay, remember when I was sitting in nothingness? Remember that? Yeah, well, I want you to just sit with, let me sit in nothingness. No higher than nothingness. Just sit in nothingness for 10 minutes. 
and he was do, building his determinations by doing this as well because he would come out he told me right at just right at the mark of 10 minutes and it would buzz on the phone and he said it felt like two hours of sleep like he had gone somewhere and completely sacked out he was totally refreshed this is really good thing to know because if there's a disaster and you want to help and people need to they're going crazy and everybody's working so hard if this is true we should be teaching people on medical staffs and things like this and teachers that are taking care of kids and centers that are holding you know having to hold up thousands of people and that sort of thing in shelters they should know how to do this they should learn how to do this. And by the way, this is not new in our society because it does exist where? In the military, you get it. If you don't get it in basic training, if you're in infantry, you usually do get it in basic training. But if you're not in, in infantry, you will get a course on this having to do with survival and whatever your MOS is in the military your major point of practice. So they're doing it, but in the population is not sort of privy to this information. Okay, the base of neither perception or non-perception. Again, monks, noble disciple considers the sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come material forms here and now, material forms in lives to come, perceptions of forms here and now, and perceptions of forms in lives to come, perceptions of the imperturbable and perceptions of the base of nothingness. All our perceptions, where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime, namely the base of neither perception or non-perception. And when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. And once there is full confidence, he either attains to the base of neither perception or non-perception now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base, neither perception or non-perception. This monks is declared to be the way directed to the base of neither perception or non-perception. And then Nibbana, he goes right to Nibbana and speaks to Nibbana in reference to this subject. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, here a monk is practicing thus. It might not be, and it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity, Venerable Sir. Does such a bhikkhu or monk attain Nibbana? One monk here, Ananda, might attain Nibbana, but another monk here might not attain Nibbana. What is the cause and reason, Venerable Sir, why this monk here might attain Nibbana while the other monk there might not attain Nibbana? Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be, it, or it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. And then he obtains equanimity. He delights in the equanimity, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. Watch the key now. As he does so, his consciousness becomes dependent on it and clings to it. A monk with clinging Ananda does not attain Nibbana. But venerable sir, when the monk clings, what does he cling to? He clings to the base of neither perception or non-perception Ananda. When the monk clings venerable sir, it seems he clings to the best object of clinging. 
When a monk clings Ananda, he clings to the best object of clinging, for this is the best object of clinging, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So he's telling Ananda, if you're sitting in that state, it's okay to keep sitting in it. It's, if you're going to hold on to something, look at you're holding on to the eighth level. That's pretty cool if that's what you can do. And you can do that kind of projection and end up there. That's pretty good. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be, and it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus, he obtains equanimity. He does not delight in that equanimity, welcome it or remain holding to it. And since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it and does not cling to it. A monk without clinging Ananda attains Nibbana. So this, this is a lesson about equanimity. This is what it actually is. It's a lesson of examining uh, the strength of equanimity and the power of it. And if you like it, hmm, you're in trouble. <laughs> so by the time you're there, you should just be resting in whatever's going to ha going and happening. That's okay, let it happen. It is wonderful, venerable sir. It is marvelous. The blessed one indeed has explained to us the crossing of the flood in dependence upon one support or another. But venerable sir, what is noble liberation? Here, Ananda, a noble disciple, considers thus sensual pleasures here and now, sensual pleasures in lives to come, sensual perceptions here and now, sensual perceptions in lives to come, material forms here and now, and material forms in lives to come, and perceptions of forms here and now, and perception of forms in lives to come perceptions of the imperturbable, perceptions of the base of nothingness and perceptions of the base of neither perception or non-perception. This is identity as far as identity extends. This is the deathless, namely the liberation of mind through not clinging, not craving or clinging, okay? Thus, Ananda, I have taught the way directed to the imperturbable. I have taught the way directed to the base of nothingness. I have taught the way directed to the base of neither perception or non-perception and taught the crossing of the flood. Independence upon one support or another, I have taught you noble liberation, the Vimuti. Vimuti is the opening up. What should be done for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them that I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda. Do not delay or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That is what the Blessed One said, and the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, what's it about? Letting go. Not in the conventional reality, totally. Not disappearing personally not giving up who you are personally, not giving up tasting ice cream, not, getting, not giving up the smell of red sandalwood or the orchids or wood, I can't remember the other wooden plant that one wood plant. It's not about that. Giving up holding on, giving up craving and clinging And with complete balance, examining pure process of the human being through the human mind. That's what it is about. 
there's some real exciting things happening now with um, a couple of writers that are writing in the science in reference to um, neurocognitive science right now. And one of them coming up with a theory that is way late, I think, you know, where he's coming around, he is saying, you know, the Buddha was right. And he's saying, basically, he's explaining self and no self. And I'm trying to get my hands on this book. <laughs> I want to get my hands on this book very quickly. And um, it's about time, you know, this is one step forward for humanity to have somebody actually say that this came from the time of the Buddha and that's giving him credit for it. I may have told you once there was a big neurology, neuro, well, she was a um, brain specialist. I can't remember her name right now. And I was working on a mindfulness uh, investigation at a university in Sri Lanka. And he said, I want you to talk for about a half hour before she talks. And then he took me to tea with her the night before. So everything that I was working on for my talk, I sat there and thought about it. And then I threw it in the wastebasket. And I decided after listening to her talk at tea with us, I was going to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt who the father of neuro of cognitive psychology was and probably neurocognitive science who who the father of it really was and i my my job was in 30 minutes <laughs> to prove my point you know i did that talk and it took 29.4 minutes to do that talk he told me it was impossible i showed him the talk and i said no i can do this i have already gone through it a number of times 29.4 minutes and so i got it in 30 minutes you know, and I thought nobody's ever going to remember this. Well, a few years later, I was in Malaysia and I was at a temple and this monk arrived with four other monks and he saw me sitting at the table talking to some monks and he came over and he says, I remember you. Of course, I didn't remember him, but I did. Re when he told me what this was, I did remember vaguely in my mind uh, that there were about 17 monks on the left side in, in the auditorium at the university that were coming for this talk. And they were there when I gave my talk. And he walked right up to me and he said, you know, I can't get that talk out of my head. So I have one monk who really truly remembers that talk. And it made me feel so good. I didn't care. There was like 800 people there. I didn't care if anybody else, but the monk remembered that talk. And it was fun to do that, to figure out the pieces from what she had said, and I had recorded it on my phone, versus what I knew about what the Buddha had done. And it's, he was right on target. And back then, I hadn't put it together completely that, you know, right effort, the steps of right effort, is the exact same way that they train people when they train their brains to um, do things in the military. That's exactly how you do a form of, it's a form of brainwashing, but I don't think you should call it that. It's a, it's a purification and a resetting up. In their case, they could probably call it that, but what we're calling it basically, when you practice right effort, you, you have, it's the, the four steps are divided into two. And they're taking you in the direction of the sutta, of the sutta, all the time when you practice this. But how do you train your brain to get to the point of automatic so that the practice is happening without you asking it to? You have to understand how to train brains. You have to talk about this is what these people were talking about. And discovering how the brain is actually taught is through a system of impingement. But the impingement has to be exactly the same every single time. And this takes me back to the first conversation we had tonight about, you know, where are the teachers for TWIM and how, training them so that they can actually help each other without competing with each other. And they would ask each other for uh, share it with each other what is working and what they're discovering but if they have to keep things aligned so it's all the same five questions so we can all help each other and work together that's just like saying the brain can learn anything if you just do it the same way anybody i believe can learn 
to get on track, get on the path and go to Nibbana if they want to take the time to do that. And I mean, an uneducated, illiterate person can do this as well as a person with the papers of a PhD or doctoral thesis or anything else. There is nothing to do with that, nothing, absolutely nothing. The brain is there, it works. You want to reset it so it will empty out. And the side, the Benny, you know, the, the bonus for this whole thing is what it does for you as far as your energy is concerned and healing is concerned, all kinds of things. And I was using it last night. I woke up with so much pain in my legs. I thought I was going to scream. And then I thought, oh, what are you worried about? Just lie here and accept it and see where it goes. And then I was just getting the frame of the pain and watching the pain and letting it go until the, uh, the morning. It's all these things come out of this, you know, what we're teaching you. It's amazing. Let's go. Do you have any questions on this sutta at this point? If I go into this at this point, I'm not sure what will happen, but okay. So we have about 15 minutes, probably can do the PowerPoint if we go through it fairly quickly, but it's all material that you, the objective of the PowerPoint, by the way, was to try to give you a capsule of what you learned last year. What have you been exposed to in learning about TWIM? And are we giving you the answers that tie this whole thing together? That's what I'm after. Bharat, do you have a question? Uh, is uh, imperturbable the same as equanimity or is it different? Imperturbability is the absolute highest level of equanimity. It's like, do you remember the Upanisa Sutta when I showed you that? You remember how it was at, oh, wait a minute, let me go on the board for a second. I know you like the board. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so if I'm on the board, remember we, on the board, when I showed you the diagram of the Upanisa Sutta, it was like this. It was done at a half moon. And it started with the develop, watch what happens, you know, faith that the Buddha found something. And then you, um, <clears throat> You've practiced the first time and you feel relief, Pomoja, and you come back and practice again and you find PT, that's joy. Okay. And then when the, um, the joy fades away, it turns into tranquility. And then the tranquility fades away, it turns into sukha, and sukha is. Buddhist happiness. And the, the thing about Buddhist happiness is the vibration isn't like this. It's very nice. And it's like an internal, more internal contentment. So this is Buddhist happiness. Then if you come back, when you, when you come back, you're like here, as you're going down this whole thing, you're going in this direction like that. And you're going deeper and deeper. When you come back, by now you're you kind of learning about dependent origination. Hopefully, you're learning about that. And when you do, there's a thing here about uh, that right right in the middle of this arc that you're going through. Okay, this is knowledge, the attainment of knowledge and vision of how everything works sound familiar so by here you get this knowledge of the dependent origination then when you continue to practice what happens next um well i'm sorry when you come back from the happiness you have one more here and it's like it's a super collectedness it's a it's a uh, it's a productive super productive level of collectedness or concentration. And then you have knowledge and vision of how everything works. That's an actual attainment that we don't hear about a lot. But when you that's where I think it's neat that they called it an attainment because in order to reach Nibbana, you know how I said you have two things happening. You have your meditation development but right parallel to it, 
you have your um, comprehension. And we know that the Buddha was um, rating the progress of his monks based on how these were traveling together, you see? And that's the person that will go through to Nibbana. So when they come out the other side, they will have basic uh, things that they will know and they'll probably be able to say back to you and explain to you. Even if it's they come and do a retreat and do it the first time to go through, they probably will know a lot they never thought they would ever understand before and be able to talk back to you if you quiz them. So after this middle part, what happens is you travel on to a level called disenchantment. And that's here. And then disenchantment, when you keep going, will turn into dispassion. Now, dispassion is a very high level of equanimity. If there, when I did this chart, there was another arc, you know, that flowed through the chart like another arc that was going, I think it was above it up here. And the it was going like this at the same time. And that one was it, looking, I got curious about what you're getting curious about. And that is this equanimity, when it first starts, begins when you sit down and somebody says, don't move, sit still. And then from there, it goes all the way through all different levels of development and equanimity to the final one dispassion goes on and you experience what's called, um, what is called the Vimudi. And the Vimudi is the, um, right, liberation. That's the word for the liberation of the mind. That's exactly how you feel when you go through and come out, liberation of the mind. And when you turn back on and it turn back turns back on and the dependent origination starts happening again and the little pieces start what happens is remember we say when you fall into cessation like that okay to the cessation then what happens is when you turn back on it's not like this it's like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve and just beyond that is a big bang that is like an opening that happens and that one is nibbana and after that perception in the sense doors shifts and you have a different kind of experience when you start to go outside and walk around different things change and this is this is how we go i would say what's happening uh, i was thinking about this one day and i was thinking my students look very much like my baby somebody check your mic sarma check your microphone okay um, when I carried Jennifer around on my shoulder, I remember the first uh, spring, my guess, maybe the summertime when the, when the uh, buds, flowers started to drop off and then the little, she was fascinated watching the flowers fall off the trees and she was wide eyed and watching for seeing everything. Of course, she's a tiny thing now. She still can't tell me anything, but that's the way my students strike me when they come out of, of having, they come to you after they've experienced this, this opening here and this experience when they come to you, when they're in awe of what they're seeing. And when they start describing it, it's always the same description, which I won't go into, but, um, it's always this, and the description reminds you of how a child would perceive the world, which is a sort of incomparative awe, it's awestruck, but not able to compare it to anything. You, can, you know, wow, you know, this is something. Yeah. And that's what strikes people as something they've never experienced before. There's something definitely different going on here. So if you consider back here in these, these areas, there's another line on the chart that I have that shows you down in here where you are is nothingness. And you're, we could say this is green like this, you know, we can say this is, this is like probably nothingness like here. And then neither perception nor non-perception here in coinciding with these somehow on another line. So that's another line that's going like this, you see. And, and when 
your these to reach those levels we just discussed, just like in this sutta, you're emptying out, emptying out, emptying out, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. There's nothing left, see, and you're not paying attention to anything coming in at all. You're you're finally accepting the law of the hindrances, accepting uh, they have nothing for you and everything. So when you talk about the levels of that community, I told you that they become stronger and stronger and stronger from just being in the first jhana to the second jhana, they're that strong. And the third jhana, they're this strong. And the fourth jhana, they're this strong. And then they proceed and they reach the level of disenchantment, dispassion. And right here is like right between here, we can tell you that's probably where I would stick it imperturbability. And actually, maybe, maybe I wouldn't use it here. Maybe I would wait till you got the fruition of whatever. And then you had a stronger base and stronger base. And at the level you would get to arahatship, you would have to be um, very, very strong with imperturbability. Like the word we said to you before is undisturbability. Do you remember me talking to you about getting in the truck and going down the mountain to get the milk for the children, <laughs> the college kids, you know, at the grocery store and forgetting that the truck didn't have a good braking system and that started to rain and it was slipping down the mountain and I was managing to barely managing to steer it to the bottom without going off a cliff. But at the bottom, when I stopped the brakes, do you remember what I told you happened? It was an experience of what you could describe as this state of imperturbability because the, the equanimity was so powerful. There was no fear. After going through that, I reflected. And when I slipped into a reflection on it, but took my pulse was really low in the 50s, like a runner's pulse back then, and was not moving at all. My stomach didn't jump. Nothing hurt in my body from fear at all, nothing. That's where imperturbability is. Nothing is responding at all from the body to the brain in a fear type thing. It doesn't mean it takes away fight or flight. I wanna make this obvious, really clear. It means that if you had to fight or flight, you would take off or you would do exactly precisely what needed to be done without hurting anybody to fix the situation is what it means. You see, does it answer the question? Sarma, I think, Sarma, I think your microphone is on. Okay, wait a yes, second. Yes, I want to ask you a question. Okay, wait a second, wait a minute. Is that, is that good, Bharat? Pardon? Bharat, is that good? You understand? Yes. Yes, very clear. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Sarma, go ahead. This impetability in our twin practice, we have conjoined tran tranquility and insight. That's right. And that is the way we went about it and attaining the four formless jhanas mm -hmm. that is they are interdependent that is they are interrelated and dependent on each other that is how we went about it this impairability factor belongs to only formless jhanas are you saying this the, the dependent part only belongs to formless jhanas yes that's what you have explained in the suttas only that uh, uh, they spoke about the space and the other one is ca consciousness and both of them are uh, inter interrelated and based on the strength we gained in the jhanas we will achieve the other uh, neither perception non perception nothing nothingness and non perception and then only nibbana but uh, last uh, in the last question what was asked uh, who spoke about uh, it may happen at the arahant level. Okay. We have not faced, that is what uh, question, 
we have not seen impeccability impeccability as far as our knowledge is concerned our practice is concerned we have only attaining the formless visual visualization of formless jhanas only on particular level and when you speak about disenchantment dispassion and other things i we might not have seen and how this impeccability is related to our level it is not uh, we have not experienced i feel is it correct or not it's not it's not experienced in life is that no uh, at least glimpse we have not uh, well the thing about this is that let's try to i'm not i think tell me i think i understand your question i think yes yes please you want to know uh, please go ahead go ahead you answer i can uh, reframe his question okay try it yeah his question is that uh, what we are practicing now and what level we have uh, achieved so far is at some stage in uh, the uh, formless jhanas so according to him impeccability is the highest level so we have not yet experienced or uh, seen that uh, in our practice is that true correct correct no not i if i not uh, okay when i'm looking when i'm looking at all right let's do the waterfall Okay. This one is wrong. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is jhana one, two, three, and four. This is infinite space, infinite consciousness. nothing and neither perception nor non perception now what i've tried to explain to you is you 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 have to understand when you experience things that in this development it doesn't necessarily have to be really tangible okay <laughs> in order in order for you to have gotten here you had to have this much equanimity and it's not something you realize but you had to have that much to get there and to get here you had to have that much and to get here you had to have this much and to get here well let's not do that wait a minute um you did that wrong this one um uh i try to try to uh try to explain this to people that um okay uh that here of course when you have this much it comes in and out and in and out not always just coming and you have that much and here a two legged a two legged beast could fall over couldn't it and this one can certainly one legged beast could fall down and this one has this much i made up this story so you'd understand it the three tripods pretty strong but still you can tip on any flat side of a tripod you can fall down so it's in and out in and out okay and then with the with the fourth level what we feel has happened is there it's this it's all of a sudden it's like this and a four-footed horse or elephant or anything like that is very strong and very steady very steady with four feet a four-legged animal any any animal ostlet cat leopard anything you want to talk about now it turns out that you have to have this much and in order to experience the these levels you have to you have to have that much you can experience these levels with these three levels of equanimity now this is interesting cuz the mahayanas when they write about the equanimity they say equanimity is in the fourth jhana period but they don't expound on this enough and a lot of them are are academic people not practitioners so much it's hard to work with them to you know <laughs> to ask them about it and they're they're using one pointed concentration and the difference with the one pointed concentration is that they consider their trip in equanimity as their level of concentration 
and we're approaching it a little bit different because our concentration is kept at a productive level of concentration as a matter of fact, as instructed in the Vasudhimaga. I wanna point that out. In the first page of the Vasudhimaga, in reference to concentration, it states you should establish a productive level of concentration. If you examine productive level of concentration within the text, it means a productive level of concentration is one that allows you to reach the path and see it all clearly as it's happening. That's what's reflected in the text about that. But what happens is the other kind of, of, of of practice is they use the concentration very, very hard. And what they go into is they go into a, um, a strong, a concentration that's hard and one that's even stronger and one that's even stronger and one that's even stronger and get falls into a level of possibly experiencing these levels, but a different kind of level. It's it's not discussable. We can't discuss what we're doing with what they're doing. It's impossible. Because why? Because we took the samatha, the samatha and the vipassana. Okay. And we put a yoke on it. Like this is the bull and this is the bull. This is the bull here. Doesn't want to be a bull. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. I don't know what that is. There's a little thing here or someplace. Here we go. Undo, undo, undo. There. Um, there you can undo too. I don't care. <laughs> okay. So it has a horn here and a, okay. I'm going to just do it this way. Well, it won't let me draw. This is really fun. <laughs> it never stopped me from drawing before. There. Okay. Um, oops. <laughs> All right, I don't know what you want me to do. What do you want me to do? Help! <laughs> Somebody tell me how to get out of this. Uh, clear. No, I can't do it. All right, Samatha and Vipassana in our case is yoked together. And what does it mean? When we say it's yoked together, we have to keep the picture in our mind of two horses or two bulls that are beside each other and they're hooked together. So when we're experiencing everything, Everything we're learning and our whole trip is based on doing what's necessary where we are right now, staying in the present time. The present time, I can't write anymore. I don't know what to do. Um, Maybe you have selected the, the rubber or something like that. Again, no. select the. No, it's asking me to do this, and I don't know what this is. I don't know what that is. And I don't know how to get rid of it. Select. Select the pen yeah. once again. Wait a minute. Oh dear. I changed the select. It changed my choices. It won't let me draw. I don't know. Okay, I'm done. Just a second. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> ah! All right. So here's this. And now... Is it, it's gonna let me okay. So you have two bulls like this, okay? And these guys are working together because they are yoked like this. This is what a yoke is like. It's hooked to the animal and this then pulls the cart. This cart is like your observation. In the cart, you have your observation for learning everything. In order to learn deeply, you have to have more and more stability and equanimity, okay? One person got very angry at me when I first wrote about Samatha and Vipassana being uh, yoked together, who didn't know anything about animals being yoked together and said, you can't practice Samatha and Vipassana when they're on top of each other. But I said to him, you know, my picture is not like this with another bull on top of him with two sets of horns like this. That's not it. My two, my two things are working like as a team. And what, when we experience these levels, okay, I want you to understand the way that we're seeing them is we are experiencing the Samatha and we're going deeper and deeper and watching and watching. And as we go, the more we open our mind in an unrestricted way, the, the, the Vipassana, the insights, they come up and then they, you go, oh, wow, that's Anatta, wow. Or, oh, wow, that's a Nietzsche and you're right back in again. And then when you walk around after the sitting, you get a deeper understanding of what you just discovered. 
Does it make sense to you? Now, what's happening here is this, this, um, we can't, you know, they can't do that. You can't talk about it in relationship to the other practice because there has no awareness when they're talking about these deep states here. I don't fully understand it. I, I was saying, I, I was wanting to try it and Bhante said, why would you go backwards? And I said, <laughs> I was wanting to try it, but I, I have tried certain things of staring at a Coke bottle on a fence post until all of my vision disappears here and I have no peripheral vision at all except the image of the Coke bottle in front of me on, on, the, on the post. And when I close my eyes, that's there and I see it distinctly, it's like Casina. But it doesn't help me when I go back to my meditation at all, it doesn't help me. Because I have to be very, very light and uh, be able to be aware and clear and observing. So tell me your question again. Tell me the question again, Bharat. Tell me what is there? It is only, we have not come across so far and it is a high level you, are, you have been speaking, the impetability and uh, both uh, because in the twin, twin practice, uh, tranquility and insight are conjoined or uh, uh, yoke together, we are continuing. And uh, dispassion, disenchantment, all these things will happen in our life. Then only we can speak about impetability. And no, no, what? just, okay, wait. You said disenchantment's disconnected with life. That's not really true. Mm. When you start experiencing disenchantment down in here, in these two levels here, mm. okay, and when you're, if you're able to hold on, you have to be sure you're not jumping out of your practice. But if you're getting up slowly and getting ready and going to work and you're going to work, you can walk around. Where can you where can you move around in these? You can move around and keep these going all day long. You can get in one and stay in it all the way through the day if you want to. You can pull them up and put Mataji, them in. Sister, sister, after attaining the fourth one, yeah. You, have inter you have introduced two more dimensions. One is the space, infinitude of the space, and infinitude of the consciousness. Yeah. So, uh, on attaining the strength, depending on the, our attainment, attaining only, we can proceed further to nothingness and also na neither perception nor perception. Yes, but, but you can't. You, is, this hmm. is useless. This guy hmm. is useless. He's hmm. only in meditation. Hmm. Okay? He's only in it. Now, these three, infinite space, infinite conscious, nothingness. Can I move around in them? Yes, I can move. Yes, I can move. I can in, move. Wait a second. I can move in a retreat. In such a case, in such in a, a retreat, case, the impetability use... pertaining to only formless uh, jhanas. That's all I want to convey. No, that's not true. It is not a state beyond equanimity. Equanimity no. itself. Uh, okay, okay. Please, you're, you're, missing, you're missing something here, and I'm trying to sort it out. Bharat, mm -hmm. help me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what, what, is, what is actually happening is you're saying equanimity is one of the states you go through. And yes. it's, one, it's one of the realms you visit, but it's not a state that you can't experience in life. You can experience it in life like I did in the truck. I was sitting in, equ in equanimity in this level in the woods during my sitting while I was working in trees and then I was sitting, working in the trees and sitting, that was what was happening. And he said, go get the milk. I got in the truck and started driving. And then when the incident happened with the truck, I realized I was in equanimity. That's how I got to the bottom of the mountain. I would have been dead if I hadn't have been in the equanimity. So equanimity is something that grows very, very, very strong beyond these four levels or these four point levels here. Forget about these. These are just talking about, you know, um, absorption, just forget it. But these levels of equanimity are all usable in life. They're not, they're not the imperturbability. Let me ask you this. Do you think the Buddha went around and got mad? Did he get mad and irritated with people and have fights and stuff? No. He never did, did he? He lived in total, complete imperturbability. The rest of his life, from the point he was an arahat in fruition, he, he got to live in, take that into life and live that way for the rest of his days. 
He never was angry at anybody. He could see everything absolutely clearly. His mind was totally empty except for the present time. If he chose to sit in comp compassion in the morning for uh, two hours each morning or whatever he sat in, he was right there. When he came out, that was behind him and now he's right here. And all of that, you see, you're trying in your mind what's happening. I can see it, but I don't know how to explain it. You're okay, separating, leave it, leave it you're, separating leave it these, you're separating these in your mind and trying to say this is no, this. No, no, no. I am not separating. It, I have not come across. That's what I want to convey. Yeah. Hmm. You have this to is, uh, you have because to. four attainments are there. Yeah. That is a yeah. four. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I can uh, I Correct. can expand uh, what Sharma ji wants to say. Please. That uh, equanimity is there in uh, the first four stages. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. of us may have experienced uh, fifth, sixth, or seventh level, yeah. but uh, not uh, uh, imperturbability, which is even higher than these levels. That yes, is what the, that is what I want to conclude. Yes. Okay, imperturbability is like we're not, that's kind of what happened in the truck. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> disturbed me. But only for a brief period, and then I came out of it. Okay. okay, then, okay. I, then I was. By the time I got up the mountain, I was quite angry <laughs> about the fact that Bonte had never explained this stuff. It was uh, of course, funny. of course, of course. You know, Bonte, <laughs> you know? it Bonte was. They did not explain. Uh. I I see what you. I do see what you're saying. I do. It's hard to. It's hard to explain. There, um, there are states, and we, we can keep them going if we're fully paying attention to them. The real difference between the person that pursues this and doesn't do it and nothing else, and the person that is pursuing it and nothing else, is that that person who is completely able to be alone and undisturbed with anything and keep working on a daily schedule, will proceed through these things and not have any pressure from the outside causing any upset. And it get and that outside gets further and further and further and further away. When you come out and go home, it gets further and further away. But you still, the best way to explain it to you is like this. When you come to a retreat, I took to telling people, I'm here to help you have a baby, Nibbana. The name of the baby is Nibbana. Once you have Nibbana, you take it home with you and it's up to you to take care of it and how much of that baby, that newborn, beautiful, perfect, clear person that you teach and maintain is gonna be with you and grow up with that child or not. It's totally up to you. It's like somebody a couple of years ago tried to hang it on Bonte because they didn't accomplish something in, in South Korea that with one of those retreats and it was ridiculous. It's not our responsibility. We can show you the path. We are merely the people who are able to, the guides to show you how to get on the path and how to move down and see when you're falling off and get you to get back on to stay on as much as possible. But you have to learn to write notebooks and be able to ask the questions and give yourself the answers. That's what having a place that you come to for more than 10 days, you begin to pick up on. Where's your notebook? What did you do last time that happened? How did you fix that? You have to learn to do that for yourself. So it's for life. And that's how you keep it going and keep the baby fed, keep the baby healthy. Do we want to try the um, the PowerPoint <laughs> with power? About 15 minutes. Are you up for it? Yes? Yeah, oh. okay. Okay, let's see if we can find it. Here we go. And let me pull this down. And this is, oops, that's not it. There we go. Okay, and then pull this over. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have to go like this and go here. And here we go. Okay, so this is my little production company. <laughs> 
my friend took this picture and it won like 10th place in the National Geographic photography for that year. And then she gave me the picture. It was really nice. It was sitting in, uh, we were sitting in, um, how do we go? How do we move? Okay. So this, um, this PowerPoint is basically had a title, but I don't know what happened to it. Wait a minute. Hmm. Okay, you are sharing, screen sharing. Oh, I, I need to be screen sharing. Why can't I make it go, Bunty? Uh, we are able to see. The, sharing. Uh, we are able to see. There, okay. 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 Um, the great, this, this is uh, some notes from a couple of places that we think about when we're teaching and everybody should think about it. And, um, this is supposed to say smoke. How does a monastic smoke out the sheds? Here a monastic teaches others the detail, the Dhamma, as they have learned it and mastered it. And this is how a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni smokes out the sheds. And a noble disciple considers thus, I am not anything belonging to anyone anywhere, nor is there anything belonging to me in anyone anywhere it's an emptiness empty state it's the state you're supposed to be working at before you fall right through it's where you're you're attempting to let go of everything so that's that's good now okay so now okay so this next place is the sutta that i was just in what is imper no it's another one I, what is impermanent is not worth delighting in it came from uh, the sutta sister uh, uh, are you moving the slides we are not able to see forward i'm sorry we are, what? On, we are on the first slide Have, are you moving the slides well i i did figure out a way to move them it's not changing space bar no. maybe you can't do what? Space bar. So, oh. can you see it now? No. The first slide. We can see the first slide. This side. This is what you see. The the yes. picture. Yeah, yeah, the picture. Why is it moving and you can't see it? No. Uh, earlier it did move. Now it is not moving. All right. It, tell me if it changes. Does it change yeah. now? It no. Change? No. No. It didn't change. Oh dear. Um, there. Maybe did you I, can close it, it and restart again. Did it change now? No. Okay. I don't know why. I can try to. Ooh. Oh. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> All right. Stop sharing. Start again. <laughs> this thing does a lot of things I haven't learned about. <laughs> All right, now I want to go into the this one. And now I want to um yeah, slideshow. Slideshow. Slide mm. And start from the beginning. Go to yeah. go to the second slide. Uh oh. Uh, yes, wow. second slide, you press it. Uh, that's all. Is that the second one? Hmm. This no. is second one. No, 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 this is not second. That's the third one. All right. This is a, it's, did you see this one now? It says, can Buddha go to must teachings? Yeah. Yes, yes. Can Buddha go to must teachings from the texts along with meditation help people experience a step-by-step -step form of relief from daily suffering and move them towards more peace in the world? Yes. The noble disciple considers um, this, and you already read this, right? So there's the next one. You already read this one. And I'm back to the beginning. Okay, now I'm getting the hang of this. I just have to touch it. At the height of the Buddhist teachings in the golden age, there was something of a unique value for the average person that came out of the meditation and teaching that relieved their suffering in daily life. What was that? Our approach to investigating reveals this. You train students directly from the texts who never practiced meditation before and those who have been meditating before. And to examine how twin practice fulfills right effort and how this harmonious practice affects the practitioner's daily life if they keep using it all the time in life. 
And listening carefully to certain texts, we also hear students who explain to us why this practice begins to unconsciously permeate life and support a positive shift in their thinking and their actions. We try to sort out if it was the practice itself, the information from the texts, or both that impacted them the most. This is what we're doing with DSMC since the beginning. Students have been taught TWIM in a variety of countries, East and West over the past 15 to 20 years. They were taught through eight to 14 day long retreats, personal retreats at DSMC for various international retreat locations and by distance learning in nine day long retreats. All the retreats followed the same format of information taught along with the meditation. Nothing, noting particular training points that might be different. The barrier approach mentioned in the Vasudhi Magga is used to teach the Brahma Vihara practice, but without the usual one point in concentration. A lighter, more productive concentration allows a sharper awareness which is taught to maintain clear inner observation during the sessions. The aggregates remain fully operational even after losing feeling in the body in the seventh jhanic level. Level one, develop first the feeling of loving kindness to oneself and transfer through a wish to a spiritual friend. Level two, after the feeling stabilizes and moves up into the head, then the meditator is asked to send a wish to the wish to three other kinds of people, one at a time until they smile to see if the mind has learned to follow this intention. Level three, after mind completes that request, then new instructions are given to the student to send the feeling to the six directions first and then to all beings in all directions at once. And the practice builds up a strength and stability to then keep moving through all levels to cessation. Patience leads to the door of Nibbana. The session guidelines, there's no talking during the retreats and only to a teacher. Upon reaching a particular level of practice, you're encouraged to share your experience only with other meditators working on the same level as yourself as you move towards the objective. There are no timed sessions and only two meal bells and a Dhamma talk bell. A sound is accepted as a sound from the beginning of training, regardless of sounds in country, village, town, farm, or forest. You are taught to let it go from the start. Students must sit for a minimum of 30 minutes minimum per session uh, on, a, on a floor, bench, tree stump, or chair, and they must walk in between sessions for exercise 15 minutes per one hour session ratio. Groups sittings happen only in the early mornings and after evening Dhamma talks before sleep. Online retreats are asked to sit one half hour during their lunch break at work and walk a brief 15 minutes when they can during the day and keep their spiritual friend with them wherever they go. Meditators have a daily interview, online meditators have a daily, well, all meditators have a daily interview with a guiding teacher or an email advice using 5Q reports in the evening for online re reports and replies then come. Okay, why are you getting frozen? Okay, specific guidelines. <clears throat> Students are told at the start to only believe what you know by seeing it. You practice to attain knowledge and vision. And this is the foundation for later arising knowledge and wisdom. What you fit together by practicing TWIM. This is where the nutshell piece is. The four noble truths and how to use them. The five aggregates, six sense doors, contact and three kinds of feeling. What was wholesome and unwholesome states. Five precepts and five hindrances relationship. You will see why you cannot think a feeling away. You will see what craving is and how to let it go. What is clinging and where does it come from? How do habitual emotional tendencies lead to the birth of reaction? 
what was the Anatta teaching and how does it fit into all of this? What is human cognition and how does that help me to understand how life events are happening? How to purify and retrain the mind. Practicing right effort or twin purifies and retrains your mind. Purification equals the first step of recognizing unwholesome mind states and the second step of releasing unwholesome mind states and relaxing the mind. Retraining is kept in the third step, bring up a wholesome mind state. The fastest is to smile as you return to your object of meditation or your task in life. And the fourth step is to keep that wholesome mind state going and create more states like that one. Repeat only as distracted, only when distracted. Do not use for all arising thoughts and do not try to stop your brain from working. Twin practice works like this. The Buddha suggested we change our perspective of life from a very personal perspective of Atta to, a pra to practice living through a more impersonal perspective of Anatta instead, shifting from selfish to more selfless actions. How? By practicing right effort. And this is the easy practice to get going and then keep it going all the time in your life. The Chichaka Sutta, we begin to understand what the Anatta teaching was about when to, we see the origination of all arising phenomena, the disappearance of the phenomena, how mental prolifer proliferation occurs, the danger of gratification, and the escape from the suffering. Chichaka Sutta shows us once you see how Atta and Anatta were being taught by Buddha Gautama, then no matter what you are experiencing in life, you will realize seeing the impersonal nature life process can change the outcomes of events. This supports you to practice patience more easily. It is, this is not mine. This is not who I am. This is not myself. This is only seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or noticing the arising sensations as they essentially are. You begin to realize a Nietzsche impermanence, how things always change and you let go of blame, abandon fear, replace anger with forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness. Gradually you get closer a closer look at dependent origination by observing it happening in one event at a time. Now you watch this with more interest. Paticca Samapada becomes very important because when you see dependent origination, you see the Dhamma. And when you see the Dhamma, you see dependent origination. Three suttas lay this out completely for us. By seeing a dependent origination, you are realizing the Four Noble Truths and the three characteristics of existence become completely revealed in each cycle of twim that we practice. So what is the Paticca Samapada? It's human cognition made up of 12 conditional links producing energy that traps us in a cycle of suffering. And if we have no knowledge of how it works, it just keeps going around and around. Dependent origination the cycle of human cognition. Very early in this practice, you will identify certain terms very clearly. Buddhist meditation is observing, was observing the impersonal movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how life works. It reveals the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination and the three characteristics very clearly. Mindfulness is the observation power. It remembers what to do when the attention feels pulled away. It reminds us to complete all the steps in the six R's cycle. Delusion is Atta. It is the false idea that everything happening is personal. It becomes clear that the Anatta perspective is the opposite of this. And you begin to test that more impersonal perspective something is changing as mind gets more purified and light. And as you practice twim, more responding and then reacting begins to happen. Your confidence gets stronger and you begin to feel some relief because you are routinely purifying and retraining your brain. Throughout life, change now seems possible. 
what is the craving? If we do not understand what craving is, how can we go, let go of it and end suffering? We can't. The craving is the I like it or I don't like it mind. It is the first personal opinion that follows the impersonal conduct, co contact and feeling at any sense door. The Buddha uncovered a symptom to identify arising craving. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. The symptom warns you suffering is coming. And when this happens, you run the practice cycle and keep it going. So what changes in our life? Well, people stop reacting. They actually start thinking about how to respond. And as they continue to practice TWIM with a smile, all the time, subtle changes begin to happen. They stop reacting. Sometimes they report they don't even know why they stopped reacting. And people become gentler, more clear, giving up fears, realizing the value of balance, more hopeful for peace coming to the world. And the conclusions in this are that there really was a practice the Buddha taught that was easy to understand, immediately effective in the person's life, untouched by time that invited deeper inspection. All the levels of development throughout this meditation noticeably reduce suffering in life. And as reactions stop, responses take over, patience and clearer thinking grow stronger and more balanced. Peaceful, creative solutions arise for us. We all need this. The most important part we discover is that meditation is life and life can be meditation. I'm convinced that there are no restrictions on who can learn the practice and begin to change they will begin to change if they want to. Science tells us that this is true because of neuroplasticity in the brain. This all, this all the time meditation is both simple and practical. It can be used in all aspects of your daily life and make our interactions very satisfying and fruitful. This practice can lead a person to a doorway to experience Nibbana, but one does not have to go that far to find relief. This training offers you a level by level relief you will honestly understand along the way as demonstrated in 107. Someone asked me this past year, why do you continue being a poor Buddhist nun? I forgot this was on here. <laughs> there are many kinds of prosperity in this world, but why on earth would I disturb the prosperity that comes from helping so many people by showing them the way to understand this living Dhamma? There is an immense reward that comes from revealing this teaching and seeing the smiles it produces for others. And that is what I call real prosperity. May you reach Nibbana quickly and easily in this very lifetime. Thank you for watching. So what, what I was trying to do with this was I was trying to put a, put a kind of capsule together for you. And believe it or not, it's interesting. I left the Eightfold Path out <laughs> in the list. I thought that was special when I got to the end. But for most people, they've heard all the pieces that you learn when you come to practice TWIM. But what people constantly are telling me, even if they spend an hour with me talking to you about when they ask, what in the world are we teaching? Just an hour with me, they begin to understand that even though they heard those pieces, it really didn't mean anything. There's kind of a, 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 a serious situation with Buddhism in some parts of the world. In this part of the world, it's pretty, um, it can be very, very serious. Because in the last few weeks, I've learned, come to find out that although people learn Pali and can recite to the monk and celebrate ceremonies and things like that, many of them don't even know what the Pali means unless they're studying Pali, they don't find out what it actually means, not just for the ceremonies, but it's impossible for them to study, you know, to, to know how to say prayers at home, individual prayers for people because they don't have the meanings. They may have memorized gathas or memorized the, uh, the, the um, I tested six or seven people the other night and none of the women in my neighborhood understand what the, um, the Ma Mangala Sutta or the Mahamangala Sutta or the um, Karaniya Metta Sutta, what it actually means. So what I, I told them I would do is give them a prayer that is 
translated uh, from you know the Pali to the English to the Marathi just as a house prayer and it's you know the one that we always you've probably heard us do it where we say sabitio we were john to saborogo vinasa to mate baba twan tarayo to tiki kayo kobo and we say baba to saba mangalang rakan to saba devada and we say it to the buddha we say it to the dhamma we say it to the sangha and at the bottom there's another little thing that we say with it and that that's really important that they get these kinds of things and they're able to use them at home and they they can teach their children here's one they can teach their children and when you listen to this i it hurts your heart to to know that they're reciting this and have been reciting this over the years but they didn't know what it meant may all misfortunes be averted may all sickness be healed may no danger befall you may you live long and happily May all blessings be with you. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Buddhas. May you be well and happy. May all the blessings be with you. May all devas protect you by the power of the Dhamma. May all be well and happy. May all blessings be with you. May all the devas protect you by the power of the Sangha. May all be with you, well and happy. By the power of these protective verses, may my misfortunes be destroyed. Troubles with due to the stars or demons or harmful spirits or ominous planets. May rain fall in due times. May there be a rich harvest. May the government be righteous. By the power of the almighty Buddhas, by the power of the private Buddhas, by the power of all the Arahants. I secure protection in every way. Now that's a gatha almost everybody knows, but nobody can tell another person in Marathi what it means. And I was shocked. I didn't know. I had been working on the Sunday school. And so now we decided there's some other people working on a Sunday school. We all got together and said, let's share what we're doing. And we all came to the conclusion, I think there's five of us now, you know, that, that, when we give them a program in Sunday school, we want kids to grow up knowing what they're saying. We don't want them saying things where they don't know what it means. It's put the teenagers in a very difficult position because if other people from other religions talk about being Catholic or Jewish or Muslim or anything, they can talk about their religions. But when they talk to our teenagers, they don't have anything to say and they look foolish and they are made fun of for just for being Buddhist and criticized because of it. And, but this has happened because it's been allowed to happen because it just wasn't a priority, let's put it that way. And so it didn't happen in the monastic structure here as too disjointed, but it can happen at any time. And it's not something we should get upset about. It's something we should try to fix. So that's what we're starting to do. So I hope you enjoyed the PowerPoint because that was a little capsule. I hope. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a it's the, the, yeah, the PowerPoint. Yeah, the PowerPoint is a very good summary of the whole method and uh, the practice. Yeah. yeah. So it's and it's yeah, refreshing it the taken, refreshing the basics. Yes. It must have taken a lot of effort for you to compile that thing. <laughs> Actually, I prepared that in 200, 2015 for the university for a close of six months work with them in Pala Kelly back a while back. I think it's 2014 or something before I was uh, when I was working for them. And I thought I pulled it out and I sort of fixed it a little bit, you know, and, but it was great that it, the structure was there and I could do it because I didn't have time to do you a whole a whole thing. But I noticed now that the eightfold path is missing. There's a few spelling errors and things like that. But basically, it is pretty good. So if you guys see anything that you think should be added, or the order of it should be uh, any, something like that, please let me know. Because uh, I want to know, make it a little tighter, because I think it's pretty good. I think it's like Bharat says, it's a, a good picture of what we're doing and how we're doing it and how things run. Okay, so everybody happy? Yeah, <laughs> went through a lot tonight. Okay, so um, can we close prayer now? Okay, let's do that. Wait a second. My little bell, my little bell is very, this little bell is priceless. You know, this bell is tiny, but this bell can actually, it can sing and everything. <laughs> actually sing, here it goes. Listen. 
Are you going to do the chanting or not? <laughs> going to do it right now, okay? <laughs> May suffering ones be May suffering, suffering free. free and the fears of fearless be. May, May the grieving shed all grief. And may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May be inhabiting space and earth, David and Zagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they all protect our Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.